Triple negative, I'm uh, back I'm with some new videos. I'm sorry it's been taking me so long between videos, but I'm just trying to find the right <clears throat> quality and balance and th things worth talking about. But here's what I want to talk about this time, and that's prequels that actually work. We're two months away from the 25th anniversary of the worst, one of the worst prequels of all time, The Phantom Menace. That's not exactly, I'm not saying it's one of the worst movies of all time, it's one of the worst prequels of all time, although I don't think it's a very good movie. We've been stuck with pop culture prequels for a long time, and they're rarely good. Either they're stuck on fan service, or they just don't have this enough story to come up with. I mean, I would say uh, two prequels uh, of recent years I think are quite excellent is the uh, New Zealand series West Side, which stars Antonia Preble, is a prequel to uh, the uh, New Zealand comedy drama Outrageous Fortune. Both series are about petty, petty, petty criminals, but Outrageous Fortune is about the matriarch of the uh, family trying to make the, her dumb kids and criminal husbands go straight. And it's not a very, it was a huge hit in New Zealand, it's just not a very good. West Side, the prequel, however, where Antonia Preble, uh, who played the daughter on the uh, Righteous Fortune, plays her own grandmother, is a fantastic series. It's streaming on Tubi and Freebie. And I might talk about that sometime, but I would highly recommend you just watch that. What's interesting is from the exact same uh, creative team, but just in terms of story and social conscience and drama, I it's head and shoulders of uh, outrageous fortune. Another great prequel was uh, The Many Saints of Newark, which, unlike uh, um, West Side, connected to a, a TV series I consider great, The Sopranos. I think it's a hilarious, weird, almost comedic um, take on Dickie Moltisanti and his relationship with the young Tony Soprano. Um, great lead performance by Alessandro Nivola. Sets up a lot of... Does, has fan service, but sets it up in a way that actually kind of makes you choke on it, if that makes sense. I mean, there, um, but it was just really well done. And um, I kind of would rather you watch it after The Sopranos because it kind of just um, has an interesting context to Tony's behavior. Um, but yeah, that's good. And then there's prequels that are interesting, but don't entirely succeed, like Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. But finally, we have another great pop culture prequel, and it's the one I least suspected. Now, Sex McFarland's Ted was a 2012 comedy starring Mark Wahlberg, of all people, about a guy who, when he was a little, he wished for his teddy bear to come to life. Teddy bear came to life and talk. And what happened is the teddy bear became famous, uh, acted in movies and film. Then the fame ran out and he wound up living back with uh, a young boy named John. And, and the time, like in the, in the, the events of Ted, he and John are just stoners and losers. John has a decent job, but he's not ambitious he has a girlfriend that's played by Mila Kunis that's kind of fed up with him. And just about how those guys learn to live without each other. Or learn to live, not, not necessarily it's the end of their friendship. They learn, like, John needs, both, both John and Ted need their space. And it is, um, in terms of Seth MacFarlane's stuff, quite good. It's very funny. It has an arc. But that's kind of the problem. It has an arc. And everything's kind of resolved at the end of the film, although it's a goofy-ass comedy and has a lot of funny moments. It also wraps things up. But Ted grossed over $500 million worldwide on a $65 million budget, so we got a sequel that took place, like that came out in 2015, had Wahlberg, did not have Kunis for reasons that either she was pregnant or they just didn't have a place for the character, so they got divorced, which if you watch the first Ted... The fact that, like, um, Lori is not there is just a genuine disappointment. And this, the plot hinges on um, w whether Ted has actual civil rights, which at that point in the movie, he'd been existed for 30 years and this hadn't come up then. That was strike one against the movie. And strike two was there's a lawyer and love interest for John played by Amanda Seyfried. Now, I don't have an issue with Amanda Seyfried. Uh, I think she's actually become a really great actress in the past couple of years, thanks to that um, miniseries she did about Theranos. 
but they introduce her character as Sam Jackson. And then later it's revealed Sam Louisa Jackson. And, oh, are you ready for the joke here? Are you ready for the joke? Her name is, she doesn't know who Samuel L. Jackson is. And at that point watching the movie, blood started shooting out of my nose and I blacked out. So I never finished Ted 2. Um, so you can understand, like, when my reaction that Seth MacFarlane, who has recent, who a few years ago signed a massive contract with Universal to a development, a massive, excuse me, development deal with Universal, and announced, and it was not his idea, it was Universal's, where they're going to do a prequel series, a prequel series set in the 90s with John as a teenager and Ted. I thought of the great philosopher Master Shake. And his quote that I am mangling because it's actually referring to Meatwad. Do you believe in God? Now you look at this news. You tell me there's a God. Well, I'm here to tell you, to my utter and complete shock, and I had to have a friend talk me into watching this, Ted the series is the best thing Seth MacFarlane has ever done in terms of intent, in terms of consistent laughs, in terms of what he was actually trying to accomplish with the characters. Now, I just did a series praising aspects of the Orville, but the Orville is massively inconsistent, and it was heading to it's heading toward a good it was heading toward a good direction good direction, but again, it's massively inconsistent, and also I'm so glad they never shot. I also just an aspect I read about that episode they didn't shoot because of COVID. I'm so glad they didn't shoot it because it is not a good idea. Um. It is. It was very uh, versimil. What my what Robert Meyer Burnett would call verisimilitude breaking. But that's another story. Ted is the best thing Seth MacFarlane has ever done, and he is a guy who's uh, I have my, my my feelings about have been thoroughly mixed over the years. I've gotten great enjoyment out of his shows, but also great irritation. And I mean, the best thing about him is that he actually probably keeps Trey Parker, not Matt, Trey Parker. Up at night, staring at the ceiling, fist bald and fists bald and raged. Like, I think that is probably the best arguments for Seth MacFarlane's existence. But again, inconsistent, inconsistent. I mean, how how a million ways to die in the West has many funny jokes, but it is also it also has lots of dead spots. And I think Seth MacFarlane, one of Seth MacFarlane's problem is he seems to only value intelligence in people but he also ha seems to hate smart people so i'm not entirely sure where he's going with that but ted ted works all the episodes are are directed by mcfarlane he is credited with writing the third and fifth episode i mean excuse me the, excuse me, the first and fifth episode the fifth episode is particularly good um so how could you find how, how could you figure out a prequel to ted that that actually works it doesn't feel completely useless I will talk about the first strike about the end of the show. It does have one moment of Sam's service that does not work at all, and I'm going to spoil it because it's not relevant to the episode it's in. At the very last moment of the final episode, they come up with Thunder Buddies. Now, I bet you're thinking, Deadpool negative, well, what does that mean? Like, Th Thunder Buddies is clearly something they came up when John was eight years old and Ted first existed. No, no, they come up with Thunder Buddies in when, and John is 16, which makes him look really stupid. I mean, John is stupid, but he's not that. But he's also got to be—he's got to be stupid in a likable way. That just makes him look like an idiot. Um. But what's impressive? That is the only uh, part, um, bit of fan service. And McFarland, for a guy who li likes to go for low-hanging fruit as much as possible, like, like there's no Sam Jones cameo. There's no like here's young Lori Collins. There's no, um, there's no. There's they don't go to the grocery store, which which or, or and you don't see like a Bill Smitrovich with a, a full head of hair. I mean, I really admired their restraint. Um, so, I mean, yes, you see a flat a Flash Gordon um, poster on the back wall, but that's it. That is it. And I got to give him credit for that. Um, so what makes this work? I think, first of all, I'm going to talk about the cast. I think Max Burkholder does a very good job. 
what I think was interesting, at least about the first Ted movie, I can't really speak on the second, obviously, is the movie makes the implication that if you watch scenes where Ted is not in the room, John is just a dumb guy. He's a lovable guy. He's a well-intentioned guy, but he's kind of an idiot. And I think Max Burkholder really captures that. Like, it's funny, I saw an interview with him where he, you know, that's, like, he doesn't really talk like that in real life, of course. Uh, He's best known for playing Max Braverman on Parenthood. And he really nails that sort of weird, like, I'm cool, but I'm also completely clueless vibe that, that Mark Wahlberg does when he plays, when he played that character. Um... Uh, like he, but I, I've always feel like John would is kind of a moron, even if he wasn't a huge pothead. And then we have Alana Ubach, who's probably known best known as Suze from Euphoria. But if you've seen anything, the woman has has racked up so many credits. She's best known for playing Suze in Euphoria and uh, Serena in the Legally Blonde movies. I believe she's coming back for the third if that ever happens. But. Trust me, you've seen this woman in something, at least in these three different somethings. Her credits, the woman is pure distilled 90s. Um, but I think she gets a really wonderful showcase here, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And, you know, that's that she plays Susan, um, a John's mother, um, who's kind of an off in her old world, like... There's there's something weird about her, but like you don't really know what it is, and they don't they they explain it, but they don't explain it because Ubach plays the character in such a strange way. I mean, she's human and relatable, but she's also kind of a space alien. You kind of have to like. I think that's intentional. I think both Susan and Maddie, we're gonna get to him in a sec, are meant to be weird cartoons, and Matt and John is teenage John is a little weird cartoon as well. Scott Grimes. You know, because he's pretty much McFarlane's good luck charm at this point. Scott Grimes plays Maddie, um, John's father. He is um, a Vietnam vet, and he's also right wing and paranoid and very much the walking stereotype. But they do fiddle with that a bit in a way I really enjoy. I really appreciated. Um, once again, I'm going to be talking more about Scott Grimes than any other YouTuber ever has. Um, specifically his acting, I should say, I should say. And again, he has this way of like, um, playing these characters that have a lot of anger issues and a lot of like passion, but also making them human and sympathetic. In the original first Ted movie, um, the, the appearance were played by Ralph Garman and Alex Borstein. And I wouldn't have minded them returning, mainly because, you know, it's Alex Borstein's terrific, but she probably has something better to do. And I think Ralph Garman is a talented man who has made the horrific mistake of tying himself to Kevin, to the, to the ballast that is Kevin Smith. Anything that keeps him away from Kevin Smith for five seconds is something that should be praised and loved. But they don't even get a walk on, so. But what makes the series stand out is the addition of a character an- another character we haven't seen before and what actually gives the prequel its texture is Blair Bennett um and I'm going to read the wiki I'm going to be quoting the wikipedia here Georgia Wiggum from the second season of the Punisher and it's John's knowledgeable sarcastically political liberal cousin and Marty and Su- Maddie and Susan niece who attends Emerson College and I know your your first thing you're thinking of is is this the live action Haley Smith? And the um, short answer is yes. Long answer is, but she's not a bitch. Oh, <laughs> man. But I, I had to say it. Um, now, Blair is where the show gets interesting. Blair is. Um, kind of angry, kind of really angry. Um, she goes, like, she's living with them when she goes to college, but in the first episode, she realized the real reason she lived with, she lives with Maddie and Susan and John, I mean, ostensibly because they're co- if she's clo- the house is closer to her college than her parents' house, is that she's miserable at home, her parents are always fighting, her home life is awful, and while she doesn't like 
Susan and Maddie that much. It's better than whatever she's living with there. Now, um, Georgia Wiggum appeared in two episodes of the Orville. Um, she, um, or Georgia Wiggum, she appeared in the episode where they just blatantly ripped off a, a premise from Black Mirror, where she was um, a resident of a planet filled with, uh, that was obsessed with um, likes and dislikes and um, the tyranny of the majority, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, she then appeared in the series finale, let's call it that, Future Unknown, as that same character, only at this point she wanted to basically leave the leave the planet because she was tired of living there and she didn't know what else she could do everyone was angry everyone was unhappy and it was pretty fascinating a performance and here she plays blair and blair is someone very different than what Maddie, Susan, and John are used to. She's not a saint. She's pushy. She can be mean. Like, one of the more fascinating episodes is an episode where she, she discovers Susan, um, who has been a stay-at-home mom, you know, for most of her life, has teaching, has teaching credentials. And she kind of just sort of badgers a Susan into, like, becoming a substitute teacher and it's well-intentioned but it doesn't go the way she wants that's an episode actually written by mcfarland but like what's fat what makes blair fascinating is and what makes the show fascinating is blair wants better not just for herself but for maddie susan and john and we know in the case of john she fails in the first episode she's she like they go out to buy weed they wind up buying weed from her and she's genuinely angry that she's like 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 um that like she accidentally sold like it's complicated she accidentally sold weed to a six-year-old kid she doesn't want john to have a shitty life now john in the ted movie doesn't have a shitty life he's happy but is he the best person he could be? And the answer is no. And that lands a melancholy to the Ted movies that I'm not entirely certain because Wiggum plays her like as angry as she is and cynical as she is. She's angry because she wants, she, she cares about people. Um, and that resonated with me a lot as someone who had a Blair in my life for a long period of time. Not to get into much detail, but like John, I failed her miserably. And... I, I she would she would argue that I wasn't meant to fail her, but that's how I feel. Like I, I'm sure if I, I posed that question to her, she would say, No, that's not how it worked. And but that doesn't make it any less untrue for me. And a Wiggum, I think is, I think her performance is very good. Um I'm gonna kinda drop a spoiler because they kind of scream it at you from like the beginning is like she turns out, by her own definition, and nobody said this in the 90s, the, the show is set in 1993, 94. It ends with the with the Bronco chase, but there is some stuff, like, I, I could swear, like, I don't think the Macarena existed in 94, but they make Macarena jokes. And in the, 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 uh, in the sixth episode, Loud Night, written by Julia Sharp, um... Blair comes out as she, she, her defense is sexually fluid. I don't think anybody used that term in 1994. But basically, Maddie is homophobic. 
He's confused. He's angry. He's so angry. But there's this great scene where um, Blair is yelling at Maddie, trying to explain to him who she is. And she's on the verge of tears, but she doesn't cry. But what they also do with Maddie is he... And I think like I think Grimes again. I'm probably I pro I'm like the only person on YouTube who's ever going to say great things about Scott Grimes acting. They cut to Grimes and he he plays it completely silent. His reaction internally, he's trying to figure out. There's no hatred and there's very little anger. There's just confusion. That. The world that he thinks is is one way is a, is actually another way. And he and he's trying to resolve in his head like this that doesn't mean it has to be bad or there's something wrong. I mean, I would say this that that episode does more for uh I I that I mean someone who is not gay, who is not I thought I found that episode really kind of I mean it also hinges on a terrible, terrible joke. That I wish straight guys would kind of shove to the ground, shove to, when they're talking about gay issues. Um, but uh, Loud Night, aside from a certain character, is one of the best episodes. Like desperate, I would have to say, like in terms of comedy, the sec the second episode, My Two Dads, is probably the funniest because basically, John and um. John and Ted are bullied by this kid at school. So they get back at him by pretending to be his dad who's absent over the phone. But it kind of spins out and out of control where they're like the, the kid is so happy to have his dad back in his life. They start trying to actually par parent the guy, the guy over the phone. And it just goes in such a weird direction. And another great episode is Erect Erectile, Ejectile Dysfunction written by Dana Gould, where... What I liked, what I like about the show is the generosity of the characters. Like it's about John and Ted trying to run a porno, but the episode kind of shifts from them because like they rent a porno, they get it stuck in the VCR, but then the episode becomes not 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 really about John and Ted trying to deal with this issue, but the fact that Susan found it and what and Ubach, what Ubach does in this episode, is like just so perfect. And her reaction sequence scenes, it's just like, and again, like it is a weird performance, but it's a human performance. And again, the Ubach is very good in desperately seeking Susan. Like, uh, that, like you would say the ep best episodes are My Two Dads, Eject All Dysfunction, and Desperately Seeking Susan. Because uh, there's a bit where she has to talk with a little girl, with a girl who's upset at school. And... <laughs> It builds to this one thing you're expecting because she's the prettiest girl. She thinks she has the prettiest girl problems. Then she admits what's really wrong. And I just could not stop laughing. I mean, it's just like, it just really, again, like, but there's also a human core to it. A human core I w don't really expect from Seth MacFarlane. And again, the ratings have allegedly, because you never know with streaming services, have been fantastic. And while so far it is billed as a limited series and McFarlane has a lot of stuff he wants to do with Universal. So I don't know if it would continue with him. He directed every episode and and I think he at least has an idea. But McFarlane has kind of put a clock on the show because eventually he's going to have to explain where Cousin Blair is and why Ted and... Um, uh, Ted and John never talk about her in those movies. And I'm not sure Ted the series is built for that. But the fact that, like, I mean, it's not like Blair is wonderful, but, Blair, like, and I, and I, and I don't want it to sound like a, some sort of Georgia Wiggum mash note. I think she's really good in the role. But there's something really sad about the fact that, like, I mean, she wanted better things for John, and but he didn't. Or he didn't think about that. You know, like what happened to Cousin Blair? Did she die? And that 
makes the series resonate for me in a way I completely didn't expect. And honestly, it took me a while to finish it because I didn't want the last episode to start setting that up. Like maybe she develops a drug problem or she says, I'm going to fucking, I can't fucking stand you people. I'm going away. And that doesn't happen. Nothing, you know, but again, once you get to that ending and you actually think about the John, John you're seeing here, who is messed up, but has, has a chance to the John you see in the first movie, who is, is not unhappy, but also a complete mess. It's kind of upsetting. It's genuinely upsetting. Um, and, uh, I gotta tell you that, that, that was not a bomb. That was like the last thing I expected out of a prequel to fucking Ted. So I think Seth MacFarlane should be commended for pulling that off. Um, and if Ted returns to the cock, um, again, I don't know how I'm going to feel about that. I don't know if I want to, I, I, I don't want to know what happened to cousin Blair. I'd rather not. Eh. Although Georgia Wiggum does look fantastic in, in, in dressed as Catwoman. Uh, but I highly recommend this series if nothing much for the form, particularly the performances of Ubach, Grimes, and Wiggum, I think, I, I hope, like, you know, they don't just get, um, like, Burkhardt was good too. I should, I should, should put him, like, I, but I think he, but like, he's been around, like, and like, I just, these are three people that, these are four people that aren't just good for Seth MacFarlane repertory players. Um, I think the, the show is funny and it talks about things in ways I didn't expect. And do I need a sequel? Do I need another season? No. Will I watch the hell out of it? Fuck yes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this TED Talk. And I um, hope you give the show a shot. Um, I Again, one of the genuine surprises of 2024. Anyway, I will talk to you later and bye-bye.